Hi, thanks for watching. I'm Damien Porter, former Special Forces Operator, and check out my new project for 2023 at hownottodie.com.au, where I've combined all my Special Forces training and police officer experience to help others. Thanks for watching. And we're live. Welcome to the Straight Talk Minor Muscle Podcast, and welcome to my guest today, Craig Chili Palmer. Thank you for coming on. Uh, thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Uh, you, you're most welcome. I'm, I'm honoured. Uh, straight into the name, um, Chili Palmer. How did you get the uh, the nickname? Um, it's funny because it's not like a huge story, but it's kind of a funny one. Where um, you know, I was in OTC back in '97, and one of the guys came out. A uh, guy named Keith Boyer, one of the combo guys, we were sitting there in the, the bay and all this stuff doing whatever we were doing. But he's like, oh, you look like freaking Chili Palmer. And I was like, what are you talking about? And because I had my hair slicked back because, you know, finally growing hair out, yeah. looking all Guido-esque, as I call it. And then uh, he was, it's the character, you know, John Travolta, this, that. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. And because then I was like, yeah, whatever, then it stuck. So uh -huh. it's not a bad nickname but it's not like a huge story but it's kind of a funny because it's all referenced off of john travolta's character and get shorty oh and and how ironic because you've gone from you know what are the the highest uh skilled military units in the world to literally in, in the movie world as well so it did make me laugh yeah. with what you've got going on there um so let's wind back a little bit um and which one am i supposed to do craig or shirley i'm, I'm not sure you let me know no, chili. My wife calls me chili, so it's that's how she met me. So it's it's more common for that. Oh wow! So your wife met you as as chili. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. So we've been, you know, sixteen years, and yeah, she met me as chili just because that's what all my buddies called me, and so it was, uh, yeah, just kind of went with it. Oh, that's that's brilliant. So yeah, let's let's wind back a bit. I'm just going to brush stroke. I mean. Always, I do a video intro, so the the audience has, has already listened to some show notes, but. You know, you've got Viking Tactics, six hour instructor, but really as the um, contractor um, for the uh, for the movie business, for the media business, but you've, you've come from the military. So what was that sort of, um, uh, what did that look like for you and then coming out of the military? Um, so for me, you know, I did 25 years in the military and 17, my last 17 was all at Fort Bragg. Um, so you know, the advice my buddy gave me um, was don't worry, whenever you put in your retirement paperwork and everything, something's going to happen. You're, it's going to work out. You're right. You'll, you'll be fine. And I know it was kind of a nervous point for my wife and I, because I came home and said, Hey, I signed my retirement paperwork. And she's like, oh, what are we going to do? And then things just lined up. And um, it's funny because I went, you know, I was finishing up in our combat development directorate and I was working, uh, less than lethal, uh, scalable effects stuff. Um, and then guys started having a requirement for asking for drones overseas. Right. And so with that started getting drone companies in and everything. And then I developed a friendship with one of the guys that, um, out of Norway. And I, cause I just, my last rotation, I was out, spent a little bit of time in Maimana, the, the Norwegian PRT out there. So it was kind of funny how it then it just connected, but from that, uh, they found out I was retired and wanted to offer me a position. So I went into the drone world. Um, yeah, I went for small Norwegian company, Proxynamics. I was the only U.S. guy in it. And uh, it was fun. It was like being in a, back in a team room again, too. So that's what was awesome and having the freedom to maneuver, um, you know, and get things done. Yep. And then uh, from that, by chance, actually, at SHOT Show, I met uh, through a friend of uh, guy named Patrick Newell who's a producer in Hollywood and uh we became friends and then he's the one that kind of brought me into the wanted to always bring me into the movie thing for the advising so um yeah chance contact and became a friend and then he started bringing me in so it was pretty neat wow it is we were, and we were talking prior such a small world and same thing with the 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 movie world I um I, I was thinking before this show is uh as we we're going I remember Lord of the Rings back in New Zealand was huge. New Zealand's a small place, as you're probably aware. <laughs> and then you got this army that that rolls up of Lord of the Rings. But I was talking to um, a guy in the gym, and his job was a he was a horse wrangler. That's what he did. 
um, you know, that's, a, that's not exactly media, but Lord of the Rings needed every horse wrangler in New Zealand physically possible to do the horse stuff they, they did. And, uh, and now, straight from that, that first gig of him handling horses, he's now progressed to that's his whole career as movie, movie world, as it were. So once you're sort of in and, and you're, you're known as that subject matter expert as, as you are, um, then it just sort of snowballs. Yeah, it's pretty neat. I mean, it's um, like anything else, it's getting a foothold and getting in, established and, and um, you know, really being easy to work with and everything else, and, but knowing your, your subject matter. And um, I had some good people along the way, a good buddy of mine, Russ Cannon, who was an armorer, but he was a retired Marine. And he was a great mentor for me when I started in the Hollywood piece. Uh, when I came on in uh, Extraction, the original one and over in Thailand for the yeah. bridge sequence, you know, I'm in there with just like full force, like, hey, when you do this, this and this, but, you know, there was already a few months of <laughs> how the movie was already being shot. Yeah. Um, so it was cool because he was like, hey, hey, slow down, come here, time out, let's talk about some things. And, um, you know, and he just really helped me along the way because it's like so much happens that at the beginning of the movie that you never see that you don't know about. You know, there's the prep ahead of time. And so if it takes four months to shoot a movie, there's there's easily a month and a half, two months of prep. Um, and so, but he, Russ really schooled me in a lot of the ways of how things, you know, are done. And then, you know, talking about like, cause then he handles all the, the weapons. So it's like, Hey, these are the guns that are available based off this, this, and this. And then that way you can start formulating the guns for the scenes and then for training and everything else. But yeah, I, I was lucky, you know, I had good people around me that uh, helped me out early on. Definitely. That's, that is so good to have someone to show you the ropes and and not make the mistakes um, uh, that the army guys can make or military guys. Are, I'm, I'm hanging to interview a man called Bill Bestick, uh, actually Dr. Bill Bestick, uh, many years New Zealand SAS, went on to become a doctor and now, uh, it's actually easier in, in your language, the anaesthetist, because in my language it's an anesthesiologist. <laughs> Either one I can go with. <laughs> yeah. So he's a very clever guy, but um, uh, long story short, um, uh, he um, he was on a, his first ever um, aeromedical um, paramedic role. So um, for the listeners, he's a doctor in, in a helicopter going to a, a, an incident and he gets out and he's like, right, you do this, you do this, you do this, you do this. And that's how we would roll, you know, in the old days, um, Chile. But they're like, whoa whoa these civilian paramedics he's like uh, do, do, do. and they got it done reluctantly but afterwards they're like hey you know why were you yelling at me here and why were you doing this and he really he self-reflected you know he's 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 a very clever guy and went geez i need to change my communication to be able to speak to these people so he had to do that but you were so lucky you had someone showing the ropes before you you rubbed anybody up the wrong way yeah and i think uh, you know along the way with military experience dealing with different folks of all walks in life you know that cross-cultural communication you know is huge and the movie is that because you have such a vast you know array of people that you can't go in there like you're you know on fire like a little first sergeant running around telling everybody to pick up rocks and everything else <laughs> you got to come in and, and manage it so um it was cool though because again i had somebody help me steer me in the give me my left and right limits but then it's just all the stuff experienced in the military as well, dealing with different folks, you know, really, really helped. And, you know, it's, uh, you're part of a team, you're not there to take over. And I think if you can be a part of that team, then that's where you can be successful. And I really think that's where special forces guys, um, and girls. Um, I mean, we've had amazing special forces psychologist on Alia Bojalova. Um, but yeah, I think that's where we can fit in so easily because we've come from a, a genre where it's it's not about the regular army, the regular sort of discipline, but we have communication. We realize that it's the team environment and that the humility to learn from, oh, that person's got all the information, but he's only been in for a short amount of time. We can learn from those people of all sort of genres as well. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, so true with so many things. And then, of course, like you said about learning from people, whether or not they're they've only been there a short time or a long time, especially in the unit, the, the special forces side of the house, because it's about, you know, it's like the village elder when you go overseas, right? It, why is that guy that the village elder and the wise guy, because he's, he's been around, you know, he's the wise man. He's seen so many things. Um, he may not be the most physically, you know, capable person, yeah, 
but he's experienced. Yeah. And, and I think that's the, the nice thing with the definitely being a brag there at the unit was, you know, it didn't matter if I was just an E6, if an E7 came in there after me, it's, it, that didn't matter. You know, he still could fall underneath me as a team leader, uh, two IC type thing. You know, if I was in one of those leadership roles, because again, I was there longer. I had the experience and knowing that place. I mean, people, you know, are still going to be successful no matter what, you know, especially a lot of folks that get to the unit, things like that, because there's a lot more effort that you have to put out. But, you know, just listening to people sometimes that are younger than you, you know, can't hurt. Oh, yes, I, I 100% agree. And we had that in a specific unit, but um, uh, I, I won't share, the, I won't go into the war stories too much because you talked about extraction. <laughs> so that'll give us that tangent. Maybe we'll come back to this one. You talked about working on the original extraction movie and um, amazing movie. And again, for the people that don't know, you know, uh, Chris Hemsworth, uh, Thor, uh, and he's in such an amazing role, former uh, Australian Special Forces into a, a single uh, operator role. Uh, and I listened to Jack Carr as my, um, uh, and you in preparation for this last yeah. week. So some interesting questions I've got there. Um, but, and, he, and he missed this one. What was it like working with, what was Chris like to work with? I tell you, he's a, he's, he, who you see when he does his interviews and everything else is who he is. He, he's just a nice guy. Yeah. Uh, extremely fa family oriented. Um, hard working. I mean, I'd see him eat his lunch, you know, on set. I mean, cause awesome. it's like, okay, well, we need to do this. We need to do this. Okay. Yeah. All right. He'd put his lunch down and eat or, and then, you know, go do the scene again or reshoot it and then come back and finish eating. Um, just an exceptionally nice guy. I'd like to joke around. I had a good relationship with him. So it was great. Cause then I could, you know, joke back with him and everything else, but he, he's just a good guy. I never saw him turn down anybody that wanted when we were in Prague for extraction too. Uh, for six months, I never saw him turn down anybody from wanting to take a picture with him or anything like that. You know, he didn't go out on the streets with all this security or anything like that. You know, he just went out as who he was, you know, so and he he's keeps his his friends with him. You know, I mean, his all the folks that really work tight with him are guys that were in high school with him. Wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. I mean, it's 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 neat to see that. Cool. Thank you for the insight. And um, I'm guessing from what you said earlier that you obviously had to train him um, with weapons uh, handling skills and so on for the role. Is that be, would that be right? Yeah. So with uh, the original extraction coming in uh, there at Thailand uh, doing the bridge stuff, um, you know, he was he's such a phenomenal, you know, athlete all around and can easily pick up things, uh, especially with the gun stuff and everything else and the fighting. I mean, how he can train for that and do everything. And he's just it it just fun to watch. Um, yeah. but so it was I got a little bit of time with him and everything, but I really had a lot more time with his stunt double Bobby Hall and Hanton. Um, because then training him up more on the gun stuff. Um, so then like on the bridge sequence, so then it was working more the tactics, a lot more the tactics with Chris. Yeah. Um, but then on extraction two, I got to actually, you know, do some real good training up front prior to, and then whenever he was handling a gun, you know, we were there right there with him, helping him out with things and you could show him once and he would get it type of stuff. It was just, he's just a phenomenal person all around. And that leads perfectly. Thank you, Chili, to my next question. You know, we've trained tons of people. Um, we've trained um, very I mean, we as in both of us, um, you know, you train a sergeant that's been in the army for years and he comes along to a special forces unit, we have to train him and we train, um, you know, like a, a private or a low ranking person. What was it like training a civilian like him um, compared to training um, from our unit? And was there sort of that, that crossover, you'd, like you said, you just teach him once and he's, he's got it? Um, it's, it's a lot different and... Um... A lot different only in the sense of, you know, you're trying to establish it more for the role right. and for what they're going to do. So reading the script and getting an idea of what the action sequences are going to be to train more for that specifically versus, you know, doing the, the, the uh, jack of all trades, master none in the SF world. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> it's, um, it was pretty cool though, because, you know, again, just really doing some of the basic stuff with the firearms uh, initially uh, we, you know, we did get to do some live fire. Uh, out there in Czech Republic, which is awesome. Um, but it it was good because it was still repetitions for some things, especially, you know, when you're talking to draw the pistol, doing this, doing that, uh, reloads with a pistol, reloads with a rifle. But 
for some of the tactic stuff and weapons handling and maneuverability with the weapon itself during some of the scenes. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, that was, he's just a very athletic person. So it was real easy because, you know, again, they're looking at the way I learned or look at the actors is they're great at mimicking. Right. So if you can show them how to do something the correct way. It's easier for them to do it, you know, right. instead of just trying to talk through something. Yeah. That makes sense. I, I didn't think about it like that. Whereas, we are all those all those different kind of learners and, and especially we've got to take in all the technical aspects every other safety aspect as well but to mimic i guess that would actually a little be a little simpler yeah it was um you know pretty neat though with with everything because you could show them something and that way you show them exactly how you want it done on the set during yeah. the shooting and then then he could pick it right up and then of course we go over to the monitor and look at it and critique can tr critique from that so it's uh but it was just, it was a phenomenal experience working with them. And, it, you know, again, I've had uh, very good luck with the working with a lot of good people. It, it makes me think back to Sean Ryan for the John Wick shows with Keanu Reeves or the John Wick movies, um, how, how, you know, you had a SEAL team and, and CAA contractor come in on, on the, on I don't know what the third is, the three call or whatever, but the, <laughs> the third movie. Yeah. Um, and and then upskill from there because because Keanu of course had shot with Taron Tactical and had a very high level of skill uh, that we saw and then Sean Ryan stepped that up a, a ton more. It was it was really interesting seeing him slot in, but it does bring me to the question that um, you did answer on um, on Jack's show uh, is bullet count and. <laughs> I love learning and I'm 49 years old and I was like, oh, I'm still the same guy. Like, oh, I'm surely they can count those bullets. Can you please just go into bullet count and into the, um, into the editing, how that, how easy it is to get that wrong from guys like us that are watching the show going, oh, surely he's out of a mag now. That was a 28th bullet. <laughs> yeah. You know, you, you look at movies and editing that the, you know, you're shooting it. And everything and you're trying to make notes while, while we're doing the scenes and saying hey this one this is a star this is great this is a weapon handling hey we need to make sure that you know we don't show this one uh so much and everything when they start editing it because that the editing happens separate so it's so different they're not they're not on you know set with you while you're filming so yeah. sometimes you know that happens where it's all of a sudden the commando you've got <laughs> you know Arnold Schwarzenegger with a with a thousand round magazine yeah um yeah. And I think, though, if you can establish showing a reload here and there, then people could say, well, he probably did a reload or he did this, especially if you lose sight of him for a minute or two. Yeah. Um, but with uh, Sam Hargrave, he's very adamant about getting things right. And so they really want to they wanted to make sure with, you know, hey, if it's a 15 round magazine standard with this gun, then we're going to shoot 15 rounds, maybe 16 if we have, you know, plus one in the pipe. So. But if we reload, then there's only 15 rounds because, of course, if it's a slide lock reload or, you know, if you do a tactical reload, yeah, we're good. But you don't do that so much in the movies. Um, but I think, you know, just getting that round count right is what's critical because then it's so believable because, you know, guys with our background, what do we do? We, we do. We analyze that <laughs> stuff because why? We lived it. It was our yeah. job. Yeah. So and we we had to know it at a very, very capable, you know, uh, situations and everything or just you know, be very capable with it because we had high stress jobs. Yeah. Just uh, I, when I heard you talk that, I went, well, that's obvious. Why wasn't I thinking that? Cause literally the editing, I'm, I think I remember Lord of the Rings, the editing was like a year, a year of editing after they shot the yeah. movie. So nobody knew where these little bits of movies were getting put together and how it was going. And like you said, you didn't even know what happened before you came in and hit extraction one. Um, yeah. It's really intriguing seeing the choreography there. Um, yeah, it's neat. And it's, it's, for me, it's pretty cool right now still, because I'm still getting hit up by the editing crew for extraction too. Right. And they're, you know, Hey, what about this? Or what about that? And, you know, I, I think it's awesome because again, it's wanting it to be perfect. So even the sounds, um, so, you know, they want impact of bullets to sound like an impact of a bullet on whatever, you know, uh, material it's going to hit and stuff. So it's pretty cool. It's, and, and Sam is, you know, just, yeah, he's adamant about it being right, which is awesome. <laughs> and I'm, I'm excited to watch the movie come out. Uh, I had no idea it, it it was even on until I 
started researching you after we started uh, speaking. <laughs> so thank you <laughs> for letting me know. Um, and are, are you working on or in the pipeline or have you worked on um, for the listeners any other um, movies or in this sort of um, uh, media world? Um, I did the the Gray Man with Ryan Gosling and Anna Darnas oh, wow. um, that came out this last July and on Netflix, and that was that was uh, just a, an awesome adventure. You know, that was really my first movie from start to finish. Yeah, and it was it was cool then to really see the beginning of it, how everything went, how much you you do to really prep for it. And you know, as a military advisor, then I was working really part of the stunt team because they're the ones that really make the movie before the movie's made because they do what's called the previs. So right. they are doing pretty much the action sequence and then getting it approved by the director and everybody else, you know, for um, the scenes to come that they're going to shoot with the actor. So now they have a training video and now they know exactly how to train the actor for that specific sequence, whether it be hand to hand or just, you know, that some of the um, movement with the guns, the tactical side of it, everything else. So, um, so it was fun. It was a it was a rough adventure, only in the sense of doing it during COVID. But the way I looked at it was like, if we can make a movie during COVID, we can make a movie any point in time. So um, it was such a great uh, learning experience and everything with that. And Ryan Gosling was just tremendous with things, and Anna Darmus was just incredible with what she was able to bring to the table. And then you know got to train with um, a lot of the other actors. Anytime there was gun stuff going on with Chris Evans, uh, Billy Bob Thornton, and stuff. So it was it was really fun. Oh, wow. I, I know it's big. I haven't seen it uh, yet um, <laughs> in between the three jobs and, and, and a firefighter. There's not that much spare time with him trying, <laughs> trying to slam them in the family. But you can really see um, how, um, how ha happy this makes you, um, uh, Chili. You know, you obviously enjoy this, which is, is brilliant. Um, maybe you could talk about your transition uh, from, and we haven't really spoken, but we've spoken to like two, two operators, you talk about the unit and so on, but uh, obviously, uh, with with Delta, the your transition from the military to the to where you are now, you went through a couple of things. You got the the, the Viking tactics, and I think you got your own chili palmer shooting and so on. But can you just talk through what that sort of looked like, sort of brush strokes? Yeah. So with uh, Viking tactics, uh, basically Kyle is Kyle Lamb's a family friend more than anything, and because we've worked together, really, I've known him since '98, and he was a team leader. Uh, for me on an assault team as well as a sniper team and just yeah again family over friendship right there and so I've been doing stuff with Kyle since really 2008 you know and then I retired in 2014 but uh, just doing a lot of the shooting instruction um, and then with that we ended up um, Kyle they wanted we did some classes up at six hour and stuff and they wanted Kyle to come into play and be a part of that and they brought me in as well as an AI for Kyle. And then of course, so now I'm still part of the Academy and, and do some classes there with six hour and everything else. So, and try to support them as much as I can in the movie side as well. Um, but the transition for me really getting out of the military and, and uh, starting to work with the drone company, uh, Prox Dynamics was, um, I think what was best for me. And I know guys have, everybody has something different. And uh, some friends of mine that retired like a year before I did and everything, you know, all of a sudden you're in the same house, the same thing. You drive to work for 15, 20 years going the same way. All of a sudden now you can't even go there, you know? And so that, that affects everybody in a different way. What was best for us was we moved away. We moved out of Fayetteville. We moved up to Virginia. And I think that helped because right away, then I was started doing everything with the, uh, the drone company. But again, it was, we were small. Um, I was, there was just two of us in the U S uh, I had a Norwegian boss and then myself being the only U S guy, like I said earlier. And, but it was about establishing this product, getting it out, doing things, uh, showing it, it, you know, demoing it, going to different army events and everything else to yep. where we could, you know, showcase the system. Um, so that was great for me because I was traveling quite a bit, yeah. you know, and busy and that helped on my side. I can read between the lines there and you've done very, very well um, to, 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 <laughs> to, to box it up that way. Moving, moving home, moving house away from, um, you know, where you were situated earlier, clever, clever stuff, changing environment. And then um, 
you know, keep him busy. Absolutely. Um, it's because some guys transition straight into the tactical training, you know, um, uh, tactical shooting like uh, Bob Keller, perfect example. Mm-hmm. Straight into that. Uh, and and another one, Nathan Dudley, because you mentioned the drones, I must mention um, him as well. We had the had the three of the guys on the, on the show and it was it was brilliant. They were just, I, w- I was... I was just hanging back, watching it all unfold. Um, but, you know, someone like Bob, he's rotated straight into that, hasn't really transitioned um, far from that, that role of what we was doing. But you you were very clever in the way you, you did that. And then, like you said, both here and in Jack's show, you're so lucky that you, you, this you, that chance meeting at SHOT Show to, to take you into the movie business as well. Yeah, it was... Um... It was just crazy the way it all happened. And it was so neat, though, because then I uh, went out and stayed with uh, Patrick, my wife and I did, in uh, in Santa Monica to his place. And, um, again, just really developed the friendship before I did any work with him. And um, he's just a tremendous guy. I mean, just supports the military 100%, you know, breaks the, the thought that everybody has of people in Hollywood. But I tell you, I've, you know, I've, met some really good people, you know, on both sides of the spectrum, you know, doing all this stuff within the movies. I mean, it's because it's life, you know, now you're just with a bigger melting pot of, of folks on a job, but to see everybody do what they need to for their job to make this movie happen is, is pretty exceptional. And uh, so for, for me though, that it was, it was getting away from, you know, brag itself and really just get busy with something that wasn't, it was helping the guys because then my son was went in the military. He's been in uh, for now about seven years. Oh, wow. So, and he's, he's in uh, first range battalion where I started yeah. way back when, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, so it was like, okay, I still have something to give back and I can still do something with the drones and then the shooting and everything else. So six hour, uh, let me do a lot of courses uh, for basically law enforcement military for free, uh, which was awesome because it was kind of like their marketing piece, but, it was, you know, I got to go down to first belt when my son was a private there and do a week long course <laughs> with a bunch of the Rangers. So it was pretty cool. Oh, that is brilliant. Wow. Wow. I, I'm proud dad. It's good to see. Um, <laughs> I, I love what Sig's done. You know, we had the 226 at, at the um, at the group and uh, it was a brilliant uh, weapon. A lot of guys it took a bit to come to grips with it, but just watching what they do now, and I think we got GBRS working with SIG and, and showing um, how how they've upgraded and, and moved on. And same with Sean, I think he, he runs a SIG as well. It's just amazing to see them progress and um, and interesting hearing you be a, a part of that as well. I do remember them sending over a 45 because we, we shot a nine mil. They, they sent over this 45 cal and we we're like, this thing you couldn't miss. It was like shooting a five cent piece, a, a penny I think you guys have over there. It was brilliant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's throwing down a big... Uh, a yeah. big bullet that's oh hell yeah for sure but it, i mean that's what i cut my teeth on was a uh we had caspian 45s at the unit when i first got there so that's what we learned uh, on and that's what we carried for years until we started going towards the clock and then i think now you know the 320 is an amazing well the m17 and m18 you know it's just an amazing you know pistol that now this these services have yeah uh, a small, we'll have a small gun chapter here i went from um, the group and came to um, I, I moved to Australia and fell into policing and they and they, and they shoot a Glock. Uh, it was a 40 cal Glock. Didn't matter about whatever. I don't even know what gene it is. I don't know those names. Um, but it was so strange <laughs> with it because the Sig you could get the sights up nice and high. Um, they're in your up in your face and the Glock. I, I had to change my posture and things and it was all that funky. Still shoot pretty straight, but it was just between those two different um, platforms. Was a, it was a tough for someone who's pop, shot millions of rounds with one. And then he's got to go to police with a Glock. And it's like, oh, that's a bit weird. It's not as easy. Yeah, I've got the experience of, uh, you know, doing training on a lot of different guns with the movie stuff and everything. It's just, so it's funny. And one thing I've done, like I said earlier, you know, actors are really good at mimicking you. So on Extraction 2, I had a couple uh, actors that were uh, left-handed. So, oh, wow. So I did everything left-handed for them because for them to try and look at me doing it right-handed and then correlate the right hands and this and that. So I got pretty good at left-handed draws and everything and <laughs> left-handed with the rifle. I mean, I was already decent with and yeah. could shoot, you know, transitioning from right to, to strong end to, to support hand with a pistol, but yeah. doing it all in one, it was kind of funny. And uh, 
I crossed myself one time when uh, we were on the range and I was doing everything in the morning left-handed. Then the right-handed shooter came in the afternoon and I was like, had to remember where I was at. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. That's a cool story. Um, I'd like to uh, just maybe delve into a little bit of the, the war stories with you with, um, with Delta. Um, were you on the, were you in Mogadishu with, with the guys? Was that one of your um, roles or was there something else that sort of stood out with you? Uh, no, I, um, I was uh, in the Ranger Reconnaissance Detachment, RRD at the time. Now they're RRC, they're Ranger Reconnaissance Company. Yep. Uh, but I had been in first bat. You know, I, I came in the military in 89, got to first bat December 89, and then got my ninth parachute jump was that in the Panama. Wow. Um, wow. But it's I didn't a, get to do jump. Somalia. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, uh, you know, I was in battalion like two weeks and we, <laughs> we jumped in. So it was kind of funny. And uh, I mean, funny now looking at everything. I mean, I was scared to death like anything then before. Yeah. And the biggest thing to me was get to the assembly area that yeah. night, you know, because then I'm around everybody. Let's get the assembly area. So um, it was a big learning curve for me because I knew I've really taken as I knew nothing, you know? Um, so it was, uh, yeah, kind of just thrown into the fire, but then nothing happened for so many years. Then like Somalia, I was, you know, just watching it on TV, like so many folks, because, you know, you think, well, you're in the military, something happens, you're always going to be there. No, I mean, military is a pretty big element and sometimes you're not where it's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> but as, was that the same jump as John McPhee did or was it a different place? Um, I'm not sure. I think McPhee did something. I think he did some stuff in Afghanistan because yeah. he was, when I got back from Ranger school, um, I graduated five February, five February, 91, which, yep. you know, 32 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I got back to, and McPhee, I think was in second platoon, Charlie company. I was in first platoon. Yeah. So he was a private when I got back. So I think he had some stuff in Afghanistan. Yeah. Oh, wow. And um, was there any deployments you could speak about um, through your, your time with Bragg that, um, that the listeners would enjoy? And I, uh, I, I mean, there's so... I don't want to put anybody on the spot, and I never have. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's so many things that we did early on before even 9-11. Yeah. You, know, um, you know, when the election, was it uh, 2000 or whatever we're... Yugoslavia we were over there kind of supporting that in a yeah. in a way if we had to get the president out um we were a small sliver with uh you know a, basically some other elements over um in Bosnia we were actually in Croatia at the time and um what was pretty cool about it was then when everything kind of settled out and we didn't have to go they're like all right hey now you guys are going to kind of do uh an area fam um so yeah, we cool. went all over the the uh in Europe, it was pretty neat just to go and visit in all the, a lot of the embassies, like anything, you know, go there because why? Well, you know, that's, that's where your direct link is, especially without, uh, with, you know, no war going on, you know, the embassies know about a lot more stuff that's happening within the country and seeing where we can support and do things, or at least give a brief on, Hey, these are the capabilities that we can bring to the table, you know, especially if you need something to happen here or even, you know, that emergency action planning of having to evacuate an embassy. So what a, uh, uh, that was pretty, pretty neat. Yeah. What a uh, amazing opportunity um, and shows the, the, the freedom, but also the, the money you guys have to, to roll off operational um, readiness to then literally familiarization through that whole area and bring everybody up to speed. That's, that's brilliant um, uh, planning. Um it reminds you of Dean Stott when you see the emergency action plan. Um, he was a contractor and started uh, doing the embassy um, evacuation plans as well. But um, it's sort of the difference between the, the British embassies and the American ones. You, you, they get Delta to go around all the different ones and, and, and check things out versus having to get a contractor and, and, and check out that embassy. Um, yeah, that's really, really cool. And what a time. I, I was on a, um, I was in East Timor at, in 2000. Okay. And uh, same thing, the first ever elections that kicked off. And, um, you know, we thought it was all just going to be World War Three. The Indonesians were going to come in and, and take it down. And, of course, as soon as, oh, okay, the votes are in and, and we're done. Okay, well, we'll, just, we'll go to these other jobs. But it was a funny time, 2000. We're thinking the end of the world. Was it, what was that called? The Y2K bug? Yeah, yeah, yep. 
the clocks won't be able to roll the yeah. Mayan calendar, all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's really cool. Really cool. Um, well, look, it's been amazing to, to chat to you. And I really wanted to touch on all the things that I did there. Uh, you're talking through um, your, your work, getting into the um, movie business. You walked in an extraction, extraction two and who you worked with. And uh, I just want to say congratulations on your transition and, and where you're at. It's so nice to see, to watch success and watch the, the journeys. And uh, I'll watch more with, with pleasure. So it's been great to, to, to speak to you and to have you on. Well, thanks. Yeah, I appreciate it. And, you know, the way I look at it, too, when we talk about, like, me transitioning out and my experience and everything else, um, for me, if anybody has any issue or ever any, any questions on anything that I can help with, that's what I want to do to the Brothers in Arms. You know, I mean, we did a lot. Um, we were successful in what we did. We got to choose another life after all that, you know, because we gave what we could. And I think, um, however, I could still give back to that to, to help guys along the way. I mean, that that's, you know, invaluable because I mean, there's, you, you can never have too many mentors and, you know, even if you're not a mentor, just a voice, you know, somebody that they can talk to that they can hear and you can tell them your story and maybe it makes a difference. That's a testament uh, to you, Chile. And I don't blow smoke. I never do. Um, <laughs> and, uh, when I say that, I always uh, wonder if anybody knows where that term came from, which is funny, but um, a testament to you because we, we chatted a little bit earlier um, uh, with the people we know. I just reached out to you and you were so um, so gracious enough to say, yeah, sure, I'll come on your show. We'll just work it out. And, and it, it blows me away. But for you to say that at the end of this show, with all your success, that, you know, just just reach out and, and, and anything I can say and do will help is so, so cool to hear. And, it, and it's across the board. Uh, Eric Miyari's uh, SMU operator, um, uh, Dutch, uh, all, all these guys are the same. They just say, you know, if one thing we can do on this show or one thing I can say or help with helps that one person, then we've done our job. Because it is about that first contact, just just reaching out. Um, w when you do make contact with a, a someone in trouble, someone in, in, in crisis or, or just someone that's a bit lost, it means the world to them. It really does. So thank you for yeah. saying that. It's, it really means the world uh, to hopefully to someone listening as well. Yeah, if we can help anybody, that's the key thing. It's kind of, you know, it's just like shooting, you know, when you're doing instruction. If I can give you one thing that makes you a better shooter, then I'm successful. If I can give you one thing that's going to keep you here tomorrow, then we're all successful. Yeah, oh, that is brilliant. Well, look, um, thank you again. I'll um, put everything in the show notes so we heard the video prior, but just uh, to, to finish up with, with voice, where's the best place for someone to find find you if they've listened to this and gone, I'd really need to, to speak to you or I'd love to find out more about what you do? Um, on Instagram, Chili Palmer Shooting, that's the best thing because oh. everybody's got got instagram and can get into that and and um yeah i mean i i try to reply to everybody that hits me up with little questions even you know some people ask me oh you know how how tall is a, an operator and this and that it's <laughs> like well you know all shapes and sizes. i mean so if anybody if i can help anybody out in any any means by all means hit me up there oh that's brilliant thank you so much well thanks again i'll hit pause we have a quick chat thank you so much for your time and coming on the show thanks i really appreciate it awesome Hi, I'm Damien Porter, former Special Forces Operator, High Performance Living Coach from HowNotToDie.com.au. And you can listen to my Straight Talk Mind and Hustle podcast, sponsored by RealKetonesAustralia.com, the best and most effective ketone supplement on the market to reduce anxiety, enhance brain performance, and supply twice as much energy as glucose. Thanks for watching.